Good morning, everyone. Uh, I think we can start. We've got uh, enough of people to listen uh, to today's talks about hypoplastic left heart syndrome. And Dr. Gaik Min uh, will give uh, the first presentation of the block uh, about anatomy, uh, echo, and embryology. Please, Gaik Min. Morning, everyone. Um, um, get me one of the pediatric ST6. So I'm given this topic to talk about, uh, not because I'm the expertise, but I think I'll let couldn't find anyone else. <laughs> so feel free to add in um, button for more information um, from the audience. So hyperplastic left heart syndrome um, has undergone, undergone a more dramatic change in diagnostic approach, management and outcomes than um, any other congenital heart defects in the recent time. Over just 30 years ago, comfort care was the only option. Um, and there are now a number of therapeutic options available for the for these patients. Um, so talk about a bit, a bit about the history. Um, the first report describing such a patient was provided in 1851 by Dr. Bad Durban a German pathologist, and it was Lev who first described the constellation of lesions making up the syndrome, although he described them in terms of hyperplasia of aortic tract in 1952, and Noonan and Nadas then grouped together the anatomic findings to define this specific syndrome. So um, HLHS makes up 1 to 1.4 percent to 3.8 percent of the congenital heart disease. Despite this low incidence, HLHS causes 23 percent of cardiac death during first week, first week of life and 15 percent of cardiac death within first month of life. While no gene abnormality is specific to this condition, there is strong evidence of supporting a genetic etiology for HLHS. Um, because the recurrent risk in families with one affected child is 0.5 to 2 percent. And on top of this, the recurrent risk for other forms of um, congenital heart disease in families with one affected child with HLHS is 2.2 to 13.5 percent. And extra cardiac anomalies and genetic syndromes have been recognized in patients with HLHS with a reported incidence of 15 to 30 percent. Um, identified heritable syndromes associated with HLHS include Kabuki syndrome, Noonan syndrome, smith blemley opitz syndrome, holt oram syndrome, and CHARGE syndrome. And there are other chromosomal abnormalities as well, including Turner syndrome, <clears throat> trisomy 13, trisomy 18, trisomy 21, and Jacobson syndrome. Although there is a Lot, um, evidence implicating a genetic etiology for the syndrome. Um, only a small number of potential disease-causing genes have been identified. Uh, as far as we are aware, the gene identified so far is um, the KX25 notch 1, ETS1, and HAND1, and this FOX2. Um, so um, but this probably accounts for one tenth of all patients born with this syndrome. In most cases, um, the specific genetic etiology remains unknown. This may reflect a multifactorial etiology for the syndrome. And in support of this, the Baltimore Washington Infant Study Group has identified environmental factors such as parental exposure to organic solvents, uh, which are associated with an increased frequency of the syndrome. Um, bit about um, embryology. So the ability to identify and follow the fetus with HLHS with fetal echo has shown the progressive nature of HLHS throughout gestation, resulting from altered left ventricular outflow or altered left ventricular inflow. And this highlighted the importance of abnormal flow patterns in the mechanism of development of HLHS. Um, there are a few mechanisms um, suggest that result in the 
and the development, development of left ventricle. Uh, in fetal life, the left ventricle is predominantly filled by flow through the um, foramen ovale, and any disturbance of flow into or out of the left ventricle may result in growth impairment. It has been observed that the uh, fetus with HLHS has a smaller foramen ovale than the fetus with the normal heart. Um, in addition to this, there is a known association between HLHS and an anatomic an abnormality of the uh, atrial septum, namely the posterior deviation of the septum primum. In this anomaly, the superior edge of the septum primum is deviated posterior and leftward, attaching anomalously to the left atrial wall, restricting the atrial level sh shunting. An intact um, atrial septum associated with HLHS has also been observed in utero and often there is a small com communication early in gestation that closes over time. This diagnosis carries a very poor prognosis. Um, in addition to atrial septal anomalies, HLHS may result primarily from a abnormal development of the cardiac valves or the left ventricle itself, um, caused by an intrinsic genetic abnormality or cause. The ventricle often appears dilated and um, the left ventricle often appear dilated and echo-bright with poor systolic function. Um, endocardial fibroelastosis, a poorly understood phenomenon whereby the endocardium of the left ventricle becomes fibrotic, is often observed. Um, fetal restrictive cardiomyopathy is present with uh, this fibroelastosis, resulting in elevation of the LV and diastolic and left atrial pressures and the subsequent reduction of flow through the foramen of valley into, into the left heart. And typically the left ventricle will appear dilated initially and poorly contractile and larger than the right ventricle, but later in the gestation um, become hyperplastic in comparison to the normally growing right ventricle. In some form of um, disease, there is an inherent abnormality of the mitral valve, which will uh, look parachute-like or arcade-like, and or the aortic valve will, um, is bicuspid or unicuspid, and multiple animal models have produced left ventricular hyperplasia as a result of the introduction of left-sided obstruction. Um, and this is a picture of the fetal echo. Um, the left picture showed the four-chamber view of a fetal echo at 20-week gestation and which demonstrate a dilated left ventricle with echo bright endocardium, suggested endocardial fibroelastosis. And the position of the atrial septum suggests um, abnormal left atrial to right atrial shunting in neutral. And this picture on the right showed the four chamber view of fetal echo in the same fetus, which was taken at 33 week gestation, demonstrate the left ventricle has become hyperplastic the echo by endocardium is even more evident. Um, so, so, I was just reading about this and find it quite interesting that um, there are a few um, research into this uh, in neutral interventions. Um, selected fetuses may be, may be candidates for intrau interventions aimed at um, altering the natural history of the heart defect. For example, fetuses with uh, aortic stenosis um, that will likely evolve into hyperplastic left heart syndrome, they try with the transcatheter transuterine balloon dilation of the aortic valve, which may lead to subsequent growth of the left-sided heart structures. And, uh, and there, it, they also tried with uh, uh, creating or stenting of atrial communication in fetus with uh, highly restrictive or intact atrial septum. Um, and uh, more recent experimental efforts to alter the in utero physiology in HLHS include the provision of chronic maternal hyperoxygenation. The rationale for this therapy is based on the principle that increased fetal pulmonary blood flow that occurs with high oxygen concentrates 
leads to greater venous return to the left heart, which may in turn facilitate the growth of left-sided heart structure. And sorry, the last one was um, the, because they recognize the global growth restriction is more frequently seen in fetus with hypoplastic left heart um, compared with a healthy control. So they also um, have future investigation to look at the abnormalities in the placenta. So come on to the anatomy. Um, so recognition of the precise phenotypic, phenotypic features of syndrome is important since hyperplasia of left ventricle can be found in several other settings. Um, and the distinct disease entities is um, not only phenotypically, but also mechanis mechanistically. And uh, this depends on variability in the morphology of the mitral and aortic valves, degree of hyperplasia of left ventricle, and the size of the aorta. Um, HLHS is basically a spectrum of abnormality due to the underdevelopment of left ventricle outflow aorta complex, resulting in uh, critical either critical aortic valve stenosis or atresia uh, with an intact ventricular septum is the most recognized form of HLHS. So um, this includes also the aortic valve atresia with mitral atresia, um, aortic valve atresia with um, mitral stenosis, aortic stenosis with uh, mitral stenosis, uh, and hyperplasia of aort ascending aorta and aortic arch, and coarctation um, occurs in up to 75% of uh, patients in HLHS. Um, so this is a picture that showed plastic left heart syndrome that um, with the underdeveloped left ventricle, um, and there is a hypoplast underdeveloped aorta uh, with a uh, communication between the atrium to allow blood flow from the left atrium into the right atrium, and also duct to allow flow into the aorta, uh, retrograde flow into the aorta to supply the coronary arteries. Um, and there are also other abnormalities associated with HLHS, um, namely the coronary fistulas um, uh, occurs, especially in patients with uh, aortic atresia uh, patent mitral valve. I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, I think your slides are lagging behind, if I'm correct. Oh. Okay, Wh which just slides? Stop, please, thanks. Uh, which slides are you seeing now? The not is it not on the uh, abnormality slide? Other abnormalities? Uh, it's in uterine interventions at the oh, moment. Okay. Probably you, share, you have to reshare your screen oh, again. Okay. Can you see it now? Not yet. Not yet. Hmm. Can you see it now? Is it still not there? Thank you. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are you able to invite me to the teaching? Yeah, sure. Do you know what's wrong? I'm doing. Can you see anything now? No. No. Maybe maybe just carry on. Uh, or like you, if you're around, you can look into it, but fine. Uh, oh, I, I'll just share my screen rather than the... Doesn't work. Oh, we can see your screen now. Yeah. You can see it now? Yeah. Uh, so is it just my screen? Yeah. So yeah, it's just screen, so we can yeah. open full mode, swipe mode. Yeah. Like this? It's fine. Yeah, thanks. Okay. So um, talking about other abnormalities associated with HLHS, um, which include coronary fistulas. Um, which are seen in patients with aortic atresia, mainly in patients with um, aortic atresia with a patent mitral valve. Intact atrial septum is also present in uh, approximately 6% of patients with HLHS, and the presence of intact atrial septum has been recognized as a predictor of poor outcome among patients with HLHS. And um, uh, the, it, can, it can occur up to 22% um, of patients with the restriction of, to flow at the level of the atrial septum as well. Um, finding of tricuspid valve dysplasia is more common among patients with patent and uh, mitral valve uh, occur in about 50% of this subgroup. Uh, in addition to the alteration of tricuspid valve function due to the left ventricular mass effect, other abnormalities of the tricuspid valve include identification of bileaflet right atrioventricular valve seen in 12% of patients. Um, persistent left superior vena cava occurs in 15% of patients and anomalous pulmonary venous drainage in 5 to 10% of patients. There's also a high prevalence of high brain abnormalities <clears throat> up to 29% of patients have brain abnormality um, and include the agenesis of corpus callosum holoprochemphaly uh, seen in about 10% of these infants. <clears throat> um, so, coming to the morphology of HLHS. Um, so that I might be repeating myself, but um, hopefully not. So um, HLHS generally have um, mitral stenosis or um, atresia, uh, and there are two anatomical forms of mitral atresia, um, either the absence of the left atrioventricular connection or an imperfect mitral valve. When the mitral valve is perforate, it's usually severely stenotic, and the leaflets are thickened with uh, tenderness cords short and intercostal spaces reduced. The papillary muscles are diminished as well, and with cords insert directly into the endocardium. Uh, the endocardial surface is covered by a layer of endocardial fibroelastasis, as mentioned before, but this, is, this happens only when the mitral valve is patent. Uh, the left ventricular wall is usually hypertrophic, producing a small spherical cavity. And uh, uh, at the ventricular arterial junction, the root of aorta is usually blind and terminates in three sinuses, and the coronary arteries arise from the blind end. Um, the aorta widens as it ascends to continue into the arch, and discrete coarctation um, will happen in 
75% of cases. This, co this coarctation located in either preductal or paradoxal position. Uh, when, the, when the aortic valve is in perforate membrane, the ascending aorta can be normal in size, um, but the major flow pathway to the ascending aorta is from the pulmonary trunk through the patent arterial duct. Um, the left atrial is usually small, although the left appendage can be disproportionately large. Uh, often the atrial wall is muscular and has thickened white endocardial lining. Um, and when the outlet of the left atrium is restricted, the pulmonary veins tend to be thick-walled as well. And the veins usually connected to the left atrium, but may occasionally ter terminate somewhere else via the liver atrial cardinal vein. The right side of the heart is usually enlarged with the floor of the oval foramen ovale um, bulges aneurysmally into the right atrium when the atrial septal defect is an inadequate. Um, the amount alignment between the valve and um, is an entrocephalic margin of its muscular rim is present in some hearts. Uh, although the right ventricle is usually well formed, it may be associated with other malformations such as anomalous muscle band, dysplastic tricuspid valve, and division of ventricular uh, chamber. So this. Images show the phenotypic variants of apoplastic um, left heart as seen in the clinical setting. So the upper left showed the variant with mitral stenosis and aortic atresia. Uh, upper right showed the mitral and aortic stenosis. And the lower left is the... Oops. Uh, the... Lower left is the variant with the mitral atresia, and to the right is the rarest variant with left ventricular hyperplasia with small aortic and mitral valve. Um, the size in keeping with left ventricle, uh, although the aortic valve is not seen in the four chamber section through the heart. So we come on to echo of um, patient. With it's a complete diagnostic and give us a hemodynamic information as well. Um, we can look at a uh, few views. So from the subcostal view, uh, it's best view to uh, assess the atrial septum and the presence of and size of any atrial communication. And both mean and peak Doppler gradients obtained to give an estimate of the left, left atrial hypertension and estimating the whether there's a restrictive atrial level shunting is critically important uh, as patient may require urgent balloon atrial septostomy in this setting. Um, so let's see if we can play the echo here. Can people see it playing? Yes, we will do, yeah. Okay, so um, if I try to play quite very quickly, but that's the atrial septum and um, see the shunting across the atrial septum there. This shows quite a large um, atrium uh, communication. Uh, let's go on to the next slide. Um, and the um, parastinal long axis view is important to uh, look at the size of a uh, discrepancy between the RV and LV. Um, the left atrium is generally small but can be dilated in the setting of a restrictive atrial septum. Um, and you can also look at the mitral and aortic valve mobility of latency um, and the hypoplastic mitral annulus, aortic valve that which is atretic or thickened and uh, subaortic obstruction and the hypoplastic aortic annulus. So 
So let's look at images again. So this is the personal long axis view. Um, don't know if people can appreciate the, the mitral atresia and aortic atresia here. Um, it be a bit clearer when I go on, come on to the image with Doppler. Oh. Okay, so I took the image with Doppler in it. Come on to parastal no shot axis view. Um, to, it's a good view to assess the left ventricular size and the systolic function, and also to look at the mitral valve papillary papillary muscles and um, the aortic valve morphology left ventricle to uh, coronary artery connections if there is any and look at pulmonary valve uh, and any PDA continuing into the descending aorta and branch pulmonary arteries can be seen from this view as well. Uh, so some video again. So this is a, uh, it shows the slit like um, left ventricle with an enlarged or, or the normal size right ventricle in this view, I think. Um, and can look at the contractility of the ventricles in this view as well. And this one is to look at the aortic valve, the atritic aortic valve here, and the large right ventricle, pulmonary valve, pulmonary arteries. Um, and show the the view with the Doppler on. So it shows good flow in the pulmonary arteries and there's some in the PDA flow there. And let's come on to the four chamber view that um, is good to look at the size and uh, assess the size of the of all chambers and, and systolic functions of a ventricle can be seen on this view as well. And to look at the mitral and tricuspid valve anatomy and annulus measurement can be obtained. Um, but, and that's the video shows the pickle four chamber view and a small left ventricle here and systolic function and the view with the Doppler on. And uh, this cross and note notch view is to look at an aortic arch anatomy, including the coaptation uh, arch interruption can be seen from this view and with Doppler, can, we can see the retrograde systolic flow in the aortic arch from the PDA. Uh, and you can get additional information on pulmonary venous drainage, any left SBC. Uh, let's look at this one. So that shows a hypoplastic aortic arch. And Doppler on that shows a retrograde flow from the PDA, it's the red flow here. Oops. Uh, and this um, the end of my talk. Uh, I, is there any question or thing that anyone wants to add to this? Contribute. <laughs> Thank you, Geek. I mean, um, really, uh, I think well done. For, it's a quite difficult topic yes. to start with, and uh, you, you did really brave. Thank you. Uh, 
So uh, my question is about um, inter in, in utero um, intervention. Uh, what is uh, current successful rate, rate of success of these procedures? Do you know anything about? And uh, my qu another question to Fu. Uh, as I know, uh, in Boston, they pioneered uh, doing this intervention. Um, do, can you tell us anything about your experience there? I've only been involved in one. Uh, I, was, I was delivered in theatre, uh, obstetric theatre, the cardiac theatre, and uh, um, there's clams immediately, like the, the placenta was disconnected, and uh, just immediately before the child was transferred to cat lab. Um, and um, the child made it for a little while, but died of other complications. Uh, haven't seen any done in Boston, but I was only there for a short period of time. And um, I suppose it's not um, widely encouraged. Um, basically, uh, if a case is like this coming through, um, we have to, you know, go through a lot of counselling. So it's for them to embark down that route is, is a very hard decision and often involve multiple discussions. Um, so we don't. Um, so the going back to your question the, regarding success, that that's completely biased. Um, I wouldn't call it um, kind of like a success, which I would say, because um, it's it's only it's probably one of the very difficult options we have to go through. Um, yeah, and. Uh, just going back to the question, you go, uh, I'm going to have a question now as well. So from the surgeon's point of view, so what sort of, uh, actually, no, Ram, Ram raises his hands up. Um, do you want to elaborate on that, Ram? Can you hear me? Yes. Um, no, I didn't. I didn't uh, wanted to elaborate on what you said. I, I don't have uh, much knowledge about yeah. in utero interventions, but what I wanted to ask about is that um, anatomical point of view, there are um, um, subsets of lesions come together. So is there anything you can add? Say, suppose from the surgeon's point of view, aortic attrition, mitral atresia has got a pretty poor or prognosis in comparing with other combinations. So anything you have come across when you look into to say what percentage of um, these hypoplasts are with atresia, what percentage with stenosis, because clinically it is significant. Oh, yes, yeah. Um, yeah, so um, Wayne Turetsky has done a presentation. Um, he's a fetal cardiologist in Boston at the BCC at Liverpool a few years back. And um, he kind of just gave various prediction score whether how would you um, from early, like, I don't know, 16 weeks uh, scans. Um, somebody's family got flat up very early, 16 weeks, 20 weeks, and often the, the key message for that is that um, intervention, the timing of the intervention is important um, to, to see whether because some hearts is just going to grow into a hypoplastic left heart syndrome anyway, whereas some are trying to be one and some are just because of the uh, actually the critical aortic valve stenosis or mitral valve stenosis that predisposes to this. Um, so this is why the whole difference between the syndrome and not um, so it's quite hard to predict them. And then the key message is that just the time of intervention is important uh, to rehabilitate the heart. And it, that message is uh, kind of uh, translated all across even uh, in the postnatal life as well as to even how soon we should rehabilitate the heart um, to try to promote the growth of the left ventricle uh, or left heart structure. Um, the success rate, I, I don't have a, a rough number in my head. Um, um, I would guess uh, around about 10 to 15 percent, I would say. Um, but but uh, I need to read on that. Does that, does that answer your question, Ram? Yeah, yeah, thank you. And uh, excellent presentation, Vikmin. Thank you. Uh, yes. Uh, okay. so, uh, very, very difficult topic, and um, you, you summarize it well. Um, so well done for that. Um, so just um, because it's a wider kind of forum of education, so from the surgeon's point of view, so what information uh, do, you, do you most need to, uh, the cardiology uh, colleagues to uh, provide um, before you, you take this patient to theatre? Can you um, highlight on that, please? 
you highlighted a few things, isn't it? One is that uh, interatial communication, which is very important to know, uh, which has got prognostic implications. And as I mentioned, uh, if you have aortic atresia, mitral atresia, which has a poorer prognosis, and uh, <coughs> aortic atresia often might come with very slender ascending aorta, which makes it um, difficult, or you might face more complications with the coronaries and the circulation and those kind of things. Um, I think those two, and apart from that, you just have to look at um, other comorbidities and general condition of the patient. Yes. Weight and those yeah. kind of things. What about the um, the timing for Norwood? Would you um, what what's your view on that at the moment? As soon as possible. Yeah. Not on the day of surgery, not day one, but yeah, preferably within the few days of after yeah. birth. Yeah, would they know the ideal condition with ICU beds and all in uh, I, I think ICU beds is not a problem, or we, yeah. we we shouldn't have a problem with ICU beds in Norwood cases. Uh, typically within day two, three, four is, is, is good. Yeah, that's uh, right. Because other problems are either pulmonary overcirculation with NEC and all, so we miss the opportunity if the patient develops an NEC, isn't it? And we have seen one recently where yes. a good Norwood candidate, we were forced to do a hybrid because the baby developed an NEC. That's right, yeah. So so these things makes you a bit worry that uh, you don't want to sit on them. Uh, I've got another question to uh, cardiologist. Uh, what about counseling the patient uh, prenatally diagnosed? So, so, what is current situation in UK and probably in Liverpool? Do you recommend to interrupt uh, pregnancy if it's early terms of diagnosis? Um, so, my colleague Angela McBrien, that I used to work with in Newcastle, is a fetal cardiologist, and I don't know whether there's any other fetal cardiologist on the call at the moment. Um, so she did a study uh, throughout her years of uh, comparing the UK figure or um, the local um, hospital, which is Belfast, where she come from at the time. And um, the trend's actually int interesting. Um, so despite the rates of uh, higher increasing rate diagnostic, diagnostic rates of hypoplastic left heart syndrome in utero, the rates of termination actually goes down um, despite, you know, um, the, the general approach at the moment is that we paint a really grim picture um, and just say, you know, um, two ventricle vests and one and whatnot. And the, these women are often, um, the, the system uh, is, is pretty good at the moment at highlighting risks and, um, and do performance screening and they're pretty good most uh, units um, at the moment because they what they were taught is to to pick these things up very early which is the all that you have to do is uh, to try to see whether there's any four chambers in the heart and whatever uh, any other views and that uh, they, they will then be um, done at a specialist center but most um, midwives or sonographers can 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 pick these things up on the four chamber view um, so the rate of diagnosis um, is high uh, but it doesn't correlate with the termination rate um, and uh, we, we generally just see a steady uh, number of hypoplastic left heart syndrome um, getting born um, across the country. And it doesn't reflect, um, it is not biased by, you know, culture, religion or ethnicity um, on overall. So those figures are uh, kind of within the UK and Northern Ireland. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Oleg, can you hear me? Yeah, sure. You know, it's a nice presentation. I think I just to uh, to add uh, when Fu was asking what is the um, what we the information that we need as surgeons, and I think that the 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 main challenge nowadays is uh, one is the decision making, which ones to operate and which one not to offer treatment. The the anatomical findings uh, and are very very. Uh, it's becoming more and more consistent. You have what we call a, a reasonably good patient, which is around three kilos, and you have a more or less more than two or two, two to three millimeters ascending aorta, and no significant comorbidities in good condition. Most of those, not all, but most of these kids will uh, will go operate through the operations, and they probably will progress to a 
sorry, without AB bar regurgitation, they will progress to uh, uh, to stage two and then probably to stage three, and they likely that they will have uh, you know 20 years of life or 30 years of life. Now the, the group that uh, and I, and that's our challenge, not as a surgeon, so I think a challenge as a group is to decide what to do with the other group, which is a group with significant comorbidity, with uh, low weight, with heavy bar regurgitations and so on, um, which uh, technically it, it, some of them will be, you know, slightly more com or more complicated to resolve, but it's possible. But despite of having achieved technical uh, uh, technically or anatomically repairs to be adequate, um, the outcomes are not great. And I think that's that's our main challenge now as as a group, not as a surgeons alone, between the intensive care, the anesthesia, and the cardiology, and obviously the specialist nurses who deal with these patients, to put all together and decide if it's the right thing to offer treatment to this particular baby or not. I don't know what the ITU, like Naga, uh, which in the call, what's their feelings from, you know, if they can see any difference in that? Because obviously they see the patient when they're in ITU, but not when they move out to the cardiology follow up. So we say that again, Rafael, uh, uh, approach about like families approach about offering things and or their feeling. Is that what you're asking? I didn't get your question correct. Yeah, no, um, you know, knowing from our experience and <clears throat> in experience from you guys working everywhere else as well is, do you think that that is a significant challenge now making decisions of which patients to offer treatment or not? Uh, and we see them going through the, uh, some cases go well because they are the correct yeah. Yeah. to operate. Yeah. And some <laughs> patients who are just, you know, deemed to be not in the right direction. <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, I think from especially from ICU point of view and as a collectively we group at times we are very clear where we are but when there are comorbidities associated other system problems or things like a bit of prematurity and a weight and these things uh, I, I think it is it is quite extremely difficult to uh, kind of take the families on the same view where we are uh, and we find it difficult I'm, I'm, I, I see Marie's there as well I'm sure but wider experience about these things, uh, it's quite challenging. I was to ask that, you know, fetal counseling and and do we have any percentage? What percentage of families like are uh, having insight of the knowledge what is happening at the moment? Uh, people say in UK not to proceed or, or to terminate uh, anybody, any fetal cardiology or anybody. Uh, just rough idea because by the time TD comes to us, uh, it has been offered. Parent families have agreed and. They have, in a way, signed up for a difficult course ahead. Well, the, um, I don't have an updated figure, but the um, but nowadays when you go into a fetal clinic and you paint a quick picture, they still want everything down to the child. So termination is often the very last on the list. Very last on the list. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, recently, we, we, we had one where, where the anatomy was like after um, exploring or, or after stenotomy, the anatomy was very very difficult, nothing could be offered. Th those family were, they, they had a feeling that they they and everybody did everything what we could and there was no option. But if there is a tiny bit of option, you know, uh, as a family and as a parents, they would like to hold on to that one. And then that becomes a very tricky situation. That's me. Uh, I think so, Anand, you're right that uh, the antenatal cardiologists do a very good job about um, uh, um, the future prospects, the lengthy, long journey, the failures and etc. But despite that, I think the expectations of the parents are increasingly getting uh, like we want everything to be done. So yeah. I, I, I see and hear that very few who would opt for termination. Yeah. Um, and that is that is the trend we see that the parents want we want everything to be done we know that we are happy to take through we take whatever age uh, the children live up to and one thing complicates is that the 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 success stories they only hear success stories through parent sure. groups the moment it's diagnosed they join a parent group of hyperplastic left heart or whatever uh, and the people who are there are the people who are survivors to certain age and you don't hear from 
um, children who are babies who died after, say, suppose Narwood operation. These people are not yeah. there to tell them the reality of what what really could happen. So they only hear the success stories, and then yes. they want they think that it's all reasonably good. So yeah. that's that's where the pressure comes for us. That yeah. um, it's extremely difficult to convince the parents after birth. Yeah. To to go for palliative care, especially. Mm. Challenge. Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you very much, everyone, for this conversation. It was a really interesting and excellent talk. Thank uh, you. So, uh, next session will be uh, interventions and imaging for hypoplastic left syndrome and we will be done by Dr. Lenk next Wednesday. See you next Wednesday. Thanks. Thank you. Everyone for listening and helping me to answer the questions. <laughs> well done, David. Thank you. Thanks.